Thank you everyone who's joining us here. I'd like to welcome you all to our very first uh, wildlife study group. If you guys didn't know, we had a pangolin full moon party last week just to get everyone started. Um, and it was a really, really great time. But now we're going to get have a, a bit more, slightly more serious conversation uh, about uh, pangolin farming today. So I, I know you, a lot of you have questions. Uh, feel free to, to put them in the chat group. We'll have full Q&A sessions later where you can unmute and ask your questions to any of our experts. So uh, stay tuned for that. Before we go any further, we really want to give a shout out to the Environmental Reporting Collective, ERC, for making all of this possible. Uh, they've actually helped facilitate this huge global network of investigative journalists to report on some of the most pressing environmental issues facing us today. And some of that work has led to incredible impact. For example, uh, our, the very first project was on the uh, was called the Pangolin Reports, and basically it was journalists across the region, uh, in different continents really, working together to try to expose the international uh, pangolin smuggling syndicates that are, that are basically uh, responsible for the decimation of the pangolin population in so many parts of the world. And um, almost, I think so many of the, most of the species are of, of pangolin are now critically endangered. So the work has been very, very important. Uh, so if you if you can, please feel free to support the ERC. So let's get, dive straight into the topic of today, right? So we've already seen the context. We know that there are, there are steps being, uh, we're moving in the right direction, at least in Malaysia, in terms of trying to revive the pangolin population. Um, but uh, there is one way that has been, has been proposed and has been tried with other types of animals, which is what is called supply side intervention, where you use uh, breeding programs or commercial farming of animals to try to displace the illegal sources of wildlife uh, and pangolins obviously any intervention you know is should be and has to be considered because we've we've lost about 1.5 million pangolins uh, from the wild since 2004 mainly because of the traditional Chinese medicine industry uh, it's believed in traditional Chinese medicine that pangolin scales have medicinal value uh, and there's really not much scientific proof to back that up at all. It's essentially the same thing as our fingernails. So, okay, to back to the, the topic at hand, can, farming of pang, can the farming of pangolins uh, actually help curb the illegal wildlife, the illegal pangolin trade? And in order to answer that question, we have a few experts. We have Dr. Chong Julian, who is a pangolin researcher for, for the past, for, for over a decade. Uh, and we also have, as I mentioned earlier, Truong, who is the head keeper at Save Vietnam's Wildlife. We'll be speaking to them in a, in a bit. But before that, we'd like to also give the chance to an amazing uh, young lady who has done some incredible work. She is uh, Trang Bui, a multimedia investigative journalist from Vietnam. And uh, she did some really brave undercover work to expose how pangolins are being trafficked and smuggled and, and uh, in Vietnam, a crossover to China as well. Uh, so Trang, please tell us a bit more about yourself and then take it away. Uh, thank you, Ian. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Trang Bui and I work with the Environmental Reporting Collective. So last year, I joined the Pangolin Reports. Um, I did some undercover work along with my um, uh, one Chinese colleague along the Vietnam and China border. And I did some data reporting on seizures. Um, importantly, I also visited a conservation center, uh, which belonged to uh, the local NGO Save Vietnam's Wildlife. Um, some, some, some of the expert at Vietnam, Save Vietnam's Wildlife is here today. Uh, and I made a short film about uh, pangolin conservation. Um, so just before I share my observations, I would like you to watch this small clip. Uh, it's an extract of the film that I made about the center. So, so that you can see up close how it is to uh, take care of pangolins. Lúc uh, bắt đầu đẻ ra là mẹ nó cuốn tròn vào trong bụng. Khoảng độ một thời gian mẹ đi ăn là nó cứ bám đuôi theo. Vất vả nhất cái thời gian cứu hộ mới về cái con là người ta là đi uh, săn bắt đấy là bắt đầu buôn bán là bắt đầu bị vết thương này, cụt chân này, cụt đuôi này bị hay là bị đầu bị mát này đấy là mình phải để ý nhất cái đấy thì uh, hiện tại trung tâm là có một cái thể tt cái tt java tên là poly thì poly là được cứu hộ từ một uh, uh, vụ buôn bán trái phép một chân trước của poly bị uh, thương bởi bẫy 
thì đã phải phẫu thuật loại bỏ cái chân hoại tử đấy đi thì do là tên tên bạn poly là mất một chân nên là không thể thả về tự nhiên được kiến là mua từ miền nam về tới đây là 200.000 trăm nghìn một cân nếu mà mới về thì nó chỉ ăn một hai lạng nhưng những cái con khoảng độ bảy tám cân nó ăn tới lên à, là bốn lạng dưới ba lạng dưới gặp những cái vấn đề mà cảm thấy nguy hiểm thì tt sẽ cuộn mình lại thì thì mình rất là khó trong cái việc là mình có thể là điều trị vết thương này kia tại vì hả mình phải để cho nó nó không có bị stress không căng thẳng quá thì nó tự động nó nó nó, nó mực nó bước đi nó bước đi rồi đúng đó mình mình đi theo cái 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 theo cái tập tính của nó là nó thoải mái thì mình mới làm được. So as you all can see, pangolin is a very special animal. Uh, as you can see from the very short clips, they are very sensitive creatures. They eat expensive ants and they give birth to only one baby each time. And they are also the most traffic animal on earth. Um, and so on the topic of wildlife farming, um, last year when I did uh, my reporting on um, pangolins uh, trade, uh, none of the experts I talked to, including the experts at Save the Nam's Wildlife, uh, none of them recommended uh, pangolin farming. Um, and actually as a reporter, I can see why. So just let me give you an overview of what the pangolin trade is in Vietnam right now. I'll just I'll give you three points. Um, so the trade ban in 2016 uh, in Vietnam that moved uh, pangolins from Appendix 2 to Appendix 1 in CITES, um, it has made the men's big trade in Vietnam appear a bit quiet. Um, we talked to smugglers and restaurant owners and people seem to be much more careful to sell or even just connect us um, to somebody uh, who can sell or who, who wants to buy. And also we see that the price is also higher um, because since, since the trade ban, for example, a bush meat has actually uh, cost double in Hanoi. Um, secondly, we, um, we have seen more large seizures. Um, despite the trade ban, um, especially in uh, two, the two uh, years of 2018 and 2019. Each year there's uh, more than 12 tons of scales and several hundreds of live pangolins are being trafficked. Um, especially like last May, there are even two big seizures in just one month, uh, all from Africa. Um, one seizure is about eight, 0.3 tons of scales and the other one is 5.3 tons um, and also despite the quiet domestic trade we actually see um, a lot of ongoing border activities um, at the Vietnam and China border um, so we pose as um, buyers pangolin scales buyers and it was uh, pretty easy to find person with connections um, and we were also able to see like some specific um, river crossing points that people are still using for wildlife smuggling. Can I just ask a quick question though? You know, uh, yeah. In the previous slide, the photo in the middle. So all those huge sacks, white, those huge white sacks, all of them were filled with pangolin scales, right? Yeah, uh, all of them are pangolin scales from uh, Africa. And and how many how many animals do you how many pangolins do you think had to die for that shipment? I think it's in the thousands, a lot. And and, and you had more than one such seizure in in a year, right? You you were saying that this was a few tons, yeah. but you more than twelve tons a year. Yeah, more than twelve tons a year. All right. Thanks. What you guys are seeing here are the pictures of scales that we were able to film. Um, undercover when we pose as uh, buyers, scales buyers. Um, these are such traditional medicine shops in Hanoi, in the center of Hanoi. Um, we went to three shops. It was pretty easy to ask them um, if they are selling scale or powder scales. And all of them said that uh, pangolin scales are good for general health and especially good for women who have uh, trouble with uh, lactation. Um, so it all brings us to the farming questions. Um, is it a feasible option or not? I don't think so um, because you can all see um, that the pangolin trade 
in Vietnam is subjected heavily to policy changes. Um, since the trade ban, it has already affected uh, the price in how people operate within the country. So I think if uh, farming is allowed, it could really spark new demand and it could feed into people's belief that pangolin scale can actually work or can cure diseases. Um, also, I think that pangolin in its nature is not a farmable animal. Um, this Dr. Chong and Chuang can tell you more about it. Um, I just spent uh, an afternoon in the center of uh, State of Vietnam's wildlife and I can see that just breeding is, is already very difficult. And um, last but not least, like how can we ensure the ethics of uh, farming when in Vietnam smugglers are already keeping pangolins in really bad condition, like dirty uh, condition, they force feed them so that they can gain weight and then they constantly cost them under like stress. Um, so yes, that is my observations, my two cents. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Trang. And uh, just to the point that you were saying that they are force fed to, to make them heavier so that they can be sold at a higher price. Because a lot of times the pangolins, even here in Malaysia as well, when we were doing our uh, sting operations, when we were being sold the pangolin, it was based on weight. So you go there, they'll, they'll wait for you to take a photo of, of, the, of it on a weighing scale, send it to you as, as verification, and then you pay based on that. Yeah. So yeah, okay. they're force feeding them basically just so they can, they can earn more money. Yeah, yeah correct. Essentially. Yeah, I think we have a, a few great questions uh, from the people in the chat. Uh, first one is, uh, why do people need to breed pangolins in the first place? You know, why, why would we want to do that? And I think that's something that Dr. Chong and, and Chong can answer in a bit. So we'll just ask you to be a bit patient with that, all right? Um, and um, we also have a question here from Claire. Were the shipments coming into Vietnam or going out? I think most of the shipment is uh, through Vietnam. Uh, it goes uh, to, uh, I think, China next. But um, in a lot of reports, we don't know um, for sure, like where's the, um, whether Vietnam is the final destination or the transit uh, point. But a lot of NGOs in Vietnam, they have um, like closer information within um, the police, um, they're all saying that Vietnam is both a transit country and also like a destination country. Okay. Uh, Alexis has, has, has given us even more information, which I think is going to be very useful. He says there, are 98, there were 98 tons of African pangolin scales confiscated in 2019, destined for Asia. Uh, so I'm guessing some to, some to Vietnam. I, I don't know where, where the rest goes. Uh, we're thinking probably China, but probably two different routes. What do you think? Mm, I think um, we can we can safely say that it goes to China because um, the data, the seizure data that I analyze, uh, a lot of the seizures um, they state that the pangolins are coming to to China, and we have um, through the smugglers that we talk to, um, a lot of the demand is from Chinese people. Uh, Hamira Aisha has a question. Uh, is there any information available on consumer behavior trends? So how are consumers, and I think this is something that Claire had asked earlier, so has, has the ban, is, is there anything new in terms of uh, how consumers are, are consuming uh, pangolins? Um, so latest information, I think there's a survey uh, in March that covers Vietnam and uh, about like four the Asian countries uh, and ask whether they would, people would be willing to consume um, wildlife products. And in Vietnam, uh, over 90%, even more, I think, um, say that uh, they will not consume wildlife uh, products because of coronavirus. Um, I worked on the project last year, so I'm not sure if it's uh, qualified as new, but uh, we went to this restaurant um, that sell uh, pangolin meat and the owner said that um, not many people dare to eat uh, pangolin anymore except for um, government officials. So that's just uh, what we heard. 
and we have not been able to uh, verify that. Yeah, maybe we can hear more from Alexis as well. Uh, I mean, Alexis, if you don't mind, uh, yeah, would you be able to tell us more about uh, what your where your information is from and and who who are these buyers? Uh, where where do you see this these scales these confiscated scales headed for? Um, I'm a director on the board of the African Pangolin Working Group. Um, mm -hmm. we, we track um, confiscations every year um, and we do have, um, you know, graph information that includes all of the countries uh, that were the source and also the destination. Um, China is definitely uh, the largest consumer for us. Um, and of course, you know, the, 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 the scales um, at source, um, Nigeria has been cited as the, um, the hub and the destination uh, point, the collecting hub and also, also um, a consumer of wildlife and that most of the export of scales goes outside of Nigeria, which we did various different uh, media articles on that. And we're also trying to control um, you know, the trade in Nigeria and other parts of Africa. Um, but definitely China is the biggest consumer. Of course, you know, the routes change all the time. I mean, as soon as you put a plug in one of the routes, then it comes up somewhere else. And, you know, there's something like, oh, I don't want to quote actually the wrong figure, but there are so many different trade routes into Asia that it's difficult for us to say, you know, if those, if, if the areas of confiscation, um, you know, are destination points or are um, collection hubs, you know, for onward, uh, onward transit. Um, but definitely for us, China is the biggest issue of concern. However, the whole of, of, of Asia um, is linked into to pangolin trade, um, you know, for uh, uh, um, uh, medicine um, and, and also for eating of the meat, of course. So the fact that, um, you know, China's new advances in uplifting um, pangolins to a status one animal and also that they've declared raw pangolin der derivatives out of the pharmacopoeia, although apparently we still have to wait for the publication of the patented um, Chinese medicines, um, and that hasn't been disclosed yet. And it's a possibility that pangolins will be included in that. Um, so, um, yeah, the, the idea that China could influence the rest of Asia in terms of their behavior and attitudes, um, their security, their legislation, and all of that is, is the point. And how is this going to affect the rest of Asia? But we can't just concentrate on China only. The whole, of a the whole of Asia has a culture of, um, you know, uh, eating pangolin meat and using it for traditional medicine, I think. And I don't have the exact specifics around the culture in every place. Mm. Yeah. But I think definitely, at the very least, we know that the, the trade is very connected throughout the region. Uh, even if it's mm. mostly fed, uh, most of the demand is coming, is going to China. Uh, there, Yeah. Every country in this region seems to be complicit to a certain extent, uh, which is why these conversations, especially coming from from where you are, is is super important. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank you for 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 giving us your point of view as well, and and all this great information you're putting here in the chat. Uh, but I'm I'm gonna go back quickly to Trang, and we can have further conversations later on with all the other experts as well. Thank you so much, Alexis. Uh, at at the Trang, I mean, I I really want to know much more about. Uh, some of the work that you had to do to uncover some of these uh, trade routes as well, right? Uh, I know you managed to meet some pangolin smugglers as well. Yes, correct. Yeah. That yeah, you're just like yeah, of course I did yeah. But what was that like? I'm, I'm surely there was there was some risk involved. Yeah, well, well, I have to credit uh, Jamming. I think he's also here. Uh, he's the Chinese colleague that I've been uh, that I work with um, during last year's report. Um, so we pose as a Chinese buyer and I pose as um, a translator, local guide. We just uh, went to Mong Gai's, a border city um, of Vietnam. It borders Dongqing of China. Um, it has been known to be the hotspot of uh, the pangolin trade. 
in, between Vietnam and China. So um, yeah, we just asked um, taxi drivers and surprisingly they had connections to uh, smugglers. No. Okay, so the taxi driver basically was your was your was your go-to guy was your was your fixer. Yeah, yeah surprisingly. Surprisingly. Okay, so obviously the trade is worth a lot of money. Uh, were you concerned for your safety at any point? Um, well, we were not um, being attacked or being uh, threatened, but uh, obviously people were very careful um, in that border town, and they are highly alerted. So. Um, we definitely received looks from uh, the Vietnamese and Chinese alike. Um, and if we managed to uh, get in contact with smugglers, they would just put us through like several steps to test our legitimacy before they agree to like reveal more info about it. Right. Well, can I, I'm just going to ask you one last question before I move on to the, to the next expert. Okay. Why do you do it? Why do you do what you do? Um, well, we all know the greatest um, reason that we are having this conversation and we're doing work related to this memo is because it's the most trafficked mammals on the entire planet and it's going um, extinct soon. Um, especially in Vietnam, it's, I think the, uh, the wide uh, population of pangolins is almost um, non-existent anymore. Um, and it, the thing is that scales um, and bushmeat, it don't work. And so I just want to like to put a stop to this false belief that people have. Well, thank you for your work. And uh, I see that uh, Jiabin is here as well. Jiabin says hello to you in the chat. So Jiabin, thank you for Hi, your work Jamin. as well. And uh, what you did, uh, your uncover work uh, in Vietnam on the border, I think is, uh, has been really helpful to the ERC. Uh, and uh, the stories that the ERC have compiled for the Pangolin reports has gone to, I think, 16 different countries uh, at, the, at the very least. And online, who knows what other countries have been reached by the story online. So uh, thank you for, for your work. Thank uh, you. Yeah, thank you so much. And now we're going to move on to our next expert, to Dr. Chong. Uh, Dr. Chong, can you please uh, introduce yourself and uh, go ahead and tell us what you're here to tell us about? Um, all right. So, hello everyone. So, I'm Julian. I'm actually based in University of Malaysia, Tengganu right now in Malaysia. So, uh, today I would just like to share a little bit on the feasibility of uh, pangolin uh, farming based on current literature. So, just to let everybody know uh, some of the work that the pangolin expert has done. Alright, so when we talk about farming, uh, especially of wildlife, it's not something that's new. It has been in existence for since maybe about 8,000 years ago with uh, fish farming and so forth. And as such, when we look at uh, wildlife farming, it is actually a very attractive idea to many stakeholders because first of all, there are some ideas that perhaps we can farm pangolins for their meat and also for their skills. And perhaps in that way, we're going to uh, lessen the hunting pressure on the wild pangolins as well. So, and also, we are also looking at um, increasing rural uh, income and also increasing protein supply as well. And also with uh, this COVID-19 right now, we are also concerned whether is it possible when we do wildlife farming, we can actually prevent the emergence of uh, diseases as well. All right, so when we talk about pangolin farming or wildlife farming for that matter, there's actually 17 conditions to be met before it should be considered. So first of all, we are talking about the biophysical sector where we talk about whether the pangolins are easy or not to be found and whether when we uh, collect things or products that we want from the animals, whether it's going to be destructive or not and also at the same time, whether wild pangolins can actually be accessible or can kind of replace the farm animals as well. So over here you can see that out of the three uh, biophysical conditions, there's only two conditions met. Okay, next please. For the, all right. And then for the laboratory, there's actually two main things. One is based on trade restriction and also whether uh, the harvest is actually well controlled. Unfortunately, we find that this is not very well done in many of the range states in parts of uh, China and also in Asia. And also, at the same time, whether these pangolin farms are going to be monitored uh, adequately 
and also rigidly. So currently, we find that this is also not being done that well. And also, there's also another issue why uh, we are also worried that these pangolin entrepreneurs might be restocking their pangolins from the wild as well. Okay, for the market, there's actually quite a bit of uh, factors to be considered. First of all, to ensure whether this uh, species is actually going to be in demand, whether it will come back a good financial investment for the entrepreneurs, we also have to look many things. First of all, whether there's also a market for it as well. Currently, we know the market is uh, uh, existing in parts of uh, Asia, in China, Vietnam, and also in Africa for meat, for medicine purposes, etc. And also, we do know that in certain areas, there are still markets existing, although they are illegal and they are also uh, regulated by trade rules such as uh, CITES, Appendix 1 and so forth. And also, we do have to see whether there's going to be a constant demand for the products from this uh, wildlife species as well. So right now, we do know that for pangolin, uh, meat, scales and also uh, medicine, there's actually going to be quite a constant demand from certain parts of the world. Um, all right, and whether we can actually distinguish the farm and wild animals. This so far cannot be done yet. It's not very easily to distinguish the wild and captive bred. And even in China, they have introduced this scale certification system, but it is also not uh, very clear because illegal trade does hamper some of their work. And also at the same time, if we look at the so-called the use of pangolin in Chinese uh, traditional medicine, we are going to notice that historically what they used was the Chinese pangolin, but when this species was depleted in parts of China, then they started sourcing it in, uh, for the other pangolin species in South, Southeast Asia, and right now they are going to take the, the supply from the African species as well. And also that we notice that um, consumers are not very particular about what species they are actually using. So we may have some issues over there. And if we look whether pangolin species uh, for the farm pangolins, are they going to be the same price or cheaper? What we find that I doubt that uh, captive breeding pangolins are going to be that cheap because if based on one study that they have done, just uh, for one Sunda pangolin in Singapore Zoo will come up to roughly about USD 7,000 per year with adequate housing, food and also veterinary care. So it's actually quite a big investment. And also at the same time, uh, due to their reproductive biology and also some uh, information that we lack, we find that the pangolin is not really that easily produced at a large scale. Because when pangolins give birth, usually they give birth to just one pango pup and very rarely there's two. So in that case, it's not like something like chickens or maybe like crocodiles that can reproduce in uh, large numbers in captivity. Okay, and then also, there's not much data on whether the farm pangolin is going to be better than the wild pangolin. And also, we do notice that consumers actually prefer to have wild pangolin meat. And also, at the same time, in China, they prefer to take the wild um, choice of uh, animals or products over the alternative type. So, with that, we do think that there's some... Uh, very certain barriers to uh, prevent pangolin farming from being a good uh, idea. And also, it might not be very good for the investor because they might incur losses in the long term. Because when you look at it, there's also a problem with uh, registration and also laws where this meat and also um, skills may not be able to reach many of the market as well. Alright, so I think based on that, we can find that out of the 17 general um, uh, consideration, there's only about six that uh, pangolin farming actually fulfills. So this is a big question mark and whether we should proceed then we should actually have more information before we go further with the idea of uh, farming pangolins. Alright, back to you Ian, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chong. Uh, do we have any questions for Dr. Chong before we move on? Do we have any questions? Oh, we have one from uh, Caroline. Can you please Feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi. Yeah, it was more um, it was more of a comment, I think, really, than um, than a question. Um, I mean that um, that presentation there was um, reflecting pretty much all of my thoughts in relation to the feasibility of um, of pangolin farming. 
Um, but also, you know, that, that some of these issues have already been seen in, in relation to other species. So, for example, that the um, African grey parrots, there's, there's already a, a huge kind of global captive breeding of African grey parrots, and we, yet we still see huge numbers taken out of the wild beyond quotas. And, 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 the, and, and in Asia, with the songbird trade, um, you know, similar to the preference of um, wild meat over captive meat, you know, they prefer the, the wild caught birds rather than captive raised birds because they say that they have a better song. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I think <clears throat> interesting paper. I'm going to have a read of that. I know Dan's hiding in this group chat somewhere. Um, yeah, I'm going to, I'll, I'm going to have a read of that. But yeah, that's pretty much all of my thoughts in relation to the, you know, the consumer demand and because yeah, it's not just a conservation or an ethical question. There's all of those issues around, you know, the social science of it and and how people respond to, to these to these things and you know and the raising of demand and making it, um, you know, more profitable, um, you know, is only likely you know, very likely to to impact on the on the levels of wild poaching. Um, it's not going to it wouldn't eradicate it. I don't think in my view. So uh, we have another uh, question or comment from Rohan. Go ahead, Rohan. Hi, uh, yeah, um, I was wondering, like, if the breeding program uh, were, was to be successful, what uh, number of pangolins would you like to reach in the breeding facility? And like, uh, be beyond that, is there an ideal number of individuals that you would uh, reintroduce in the wild? Or is uh, the breeding program just made for pangolins, pangolins to be sold to people? I think at least speaking from our last session, uh, the, we, we did ask this to uh, the Malaysian Wild, Wildlife Department as well. You know, they, they have successfully bred just one. Uh, there was actually two, but one, one died in infancy, not long after being born. Uh, so they were still saying that there's just, just so much that's happening at this point. We don't know how long it will take for the penguin to mature and to be able to fend uh, for itself. Uh, but they do intend to release it to the wild, but they, they just, it's just too early to know uh, how many can be bred um, because the success rate hasn't been great so far and also they, they just don't know how the penguin will react uh, over the next few months. The penguin is still just one month old. So yeah, hopefully that answers your question, at least from the Malaysian perspective. I don't know if uh, Vietnam has a different experience. Uh, Truong has, has, has um, I think uh, he has bred about 20 pangolins, if I'm not mistaken, if my notes, if I, my memory serves me right. Uh, we have one from Bob Zakaria. Go ahead, Bob. Hi, uh, oh, this is a question for Dr. Chong. All right. um, I read that part that uh, we are not sure on how often a female pangolin will give birth. Uh, we are not sure of that. Uh, again, are we sure that do pangolins pay up for life? And then uh, my big question is that in one hectare of the rainforest, how many individual pangolins can we find? That is very important because if you need to succeed on breeding them, I mean, I'm not a fan of animals in cages. I've seen pangolins in the world and I've walked and you don't see that many. Probably you see one pangolin after every two or three hours walk in the forest. That's about it. There's actually a few questions that you asked me. So I try to answer one by one. All right. So first was about uh, pangolins breeding. All right. So from what? We gather from current literature. I'm talking based uh, on Sunda pangolin. Sunda pangolins, there's still much that we are not very sure. We do know that they are breeding throughout the year, but then at the same time, uh, if you're talking about whether they are going to be monogamous, I doubt that's the case. So perhaps they might have, uh, they'll come together when they're meeting, and after they meet, they'll go off to their own separate way. So that's why usually in a while, you just probably might see the mother and also the, the pango pup you will not see the, the dead along. That's one. Second thing is, if you're talking about uh, the home range, all right, uh, based on a study that was done by Norman Lim in Singapore, he was doing his work in Pulau Tekong, which is actually an uh, undisturbed area because it was for the army uh, work late training ground. So nobody can actually go in unless they have alteration. And most of the time, if the army is not doing their training over there, then it's off limits. There won't be anybody around there. So from his study, he found that for a uh, uh, female pangolin, the home range is roughly about 4.2 to 5 hectare. This is based on a certain number of individuals. 
and also for the mill, it is roughly about 20 hectares. So if you're looking at that, it will be quite possible that these animals are foraging very far each night for food. So with that, you will not, it's not going to be very easy to make an estimate of how many pangolins are found in one area. That's one. Second thing is uh, male pangolins are territorial. They will actually fight each other. So if in that case, if we were to release the pangolins into the wild, we also may have to take this into consideration as well, especially if they are males. Females, perhaps less of a problem. So, uh, Mr. Bob, I hope that kind of answers your questions. Thanks, everyone. I see a lot of questions, and I promise we'll get to them as quickly as we can, but we have to move on because it's already getting a bit late. We're running behind time, and everyone has such great comments and such great feedback. Uh, so we, we're going to try to accommodate as much of it as possible. But we do want to make sure that Chuang has time. Chuang, are you here with us already? Hi, everyone. My name is Chuang. In my presentation today, so I will focus on uh, three main points. So the first one is highlights of the pangolin breeding at Save Vietnam's wildlife. And the second one is challenges of pangolin breeding at Save Vietnam's wildlife. And the last one is uh, viability of uh, pangolin farming for sale. So, up to now, we do not have an official breeding program for pangolin. So as you guys know, we are rescue center. So most of the, the pangolin we rescue uh, to our rescue center, we will release them back into the wild after one month or several months now under our care. We have never been trying to keep the male and the female pangolin for the breed, but we do have some success with pangolin who born in our rescue center because some of the female pangolin, when they came to our rescue center, they already pregnant. And during the year they uh, give birth, then we look after the baby until the baby grows big enough, then we will release them back into the wild. In the last five years, around uh, 1,500 pangolins rescued by Save Vietnam's wildlife, and 60% of them will be released back into the wild. And 20 uh, pangolins have birth successfully. Penguin is one of the species most difficult to keep in captivity because the, um, the penguin, they uh, really easy get stressed and uh, they also require really special diets. Their diets is um, uh, ants and termites. So with uh, some penguin or 10 or 20 penguins is, is okay. It, it, um, it's easy for us to find the, the food for them, but uh, sometimes we we rescue over one, 100 or 200 pangolin at the same time. It's, a, it's one of our challenge. Most of the pangolin are rescued from illegal wildlife trade in poor condition. You can see the, um, you can see the image there. So the pangolin often uh, are being kept uh, by trader in the really tight bag. So most of the pangolin we rescue from illegal wildlife trade, they have been through a long time on the transportation or transfer. So, so the pangolin, the biggest problem with their health is uh, the pangolin often uh, being forced feed by trader and hunter because you guys know the, the pangolin they sold by, by weight. So the trader wants to increase their way to get more money. We do not uh, promote farming pangolin for commercial purpose. So in 2014 in Vietnam, Save Vietnam's wildlife succeeded in working with the government to remove pangolin scalp from the list of items recovered by health insurance. And uh, a few weeks ago, I don't, uh, don't remember exactly, in China, uh, the Chinese government has officially removed pangolin scalp from a list of approved ingredients in traditional medicine. That is a really good news to the future of this species. Legalization of pangolin farming can be risky, so because of, it will increase the hunting pressure to get the pangolin to sell for the farm. So, and many people still looking for the wild product, even with some species have set it to breed in captivity, but uh, there are many people still looking for the wild animals and the poor hunters still go to the forest to hunt pangolin to provide to the market. The second one is that many farms can do is as it uh, would be a profitable industry. So, um, through interview, through interviewing um, trader, um, um, hunter, and uh, the restaurant, we know that one kilogram uh, living pangolin can cost 300 to 500 dollars per kilogram. So we do have any certainty of this blooming. And the third one is um, 
it will mix the, the animals between farm and in the wild. And they're also difficult for law enforcement when no identification between animal from farm and the animals from in the wild is difficult to enforce the law. It's many lessons learned from other species when the government believe farming wildlife could support the conservation, where the thing is the animals from farm could replace the wild product. And also they believe farming animals would develop the economy people can get the money from the farm without need to go to the forest to hunt the animals. But uh, for many other species, including penguins, farming hasn't been uh, supporting for the conservation. For example, there, are, there is strong evidence uh, that farming wild animals will not help to conservation. Tiger. Tiger farms have uh, existed for decades and have not led uh, to an increase in white tiger population, which uh, continue to decline from poaching. Thank you so much, Trong. Thank you for that. I can, already, I can already see so many amazing comments. I think people are make, making so many connections here already. Uh, I think uh, there's a, a Francois Meyer who's, who's congratulated you on your work, Trong, and says that you do similar work. Uh, he does it, I think, in, in South Africa, is it? Uh, so yeah, so I think it's it's great that we're making a lot of these connections here and we're sharing a lot of knowledge and information uh, across borders. Uh, so now we can go into Q&A in earnest with everyone. Um, I think it's safe to say that uh, pangolin farming is not going to be viable, right? It, it, all the three experts seem to say that. Alexis was saying that earlier as well. Uh, but my question now is, has there ever been uh, supply side interventions that were able to successfully displaced demand for illegally sourced wildlife. And um, this is open to anybody who's from our friends over uh, in South Africa as well. Anybody care to answer? Is, are there any case studies where it actually worked? I can see uh, Jeffrey Chang already put in the comments that tiger breeding uh, and farming is a lie. It does not serve any conservation purpose. It's mainly just for, for commercial tourism. I'm guessing that means that's a no. Like supply side in interventions are basically just not, don't work. Right. Uh, Alexis is saying that maybe Rohan can speak about, uh, Rohan, do you, you would like to speak about your breeding program? Oh no, I'm not overseeing a breeding program. I, I work on the political ecology of the human wildlife conflict. So this is why I was very interested in this topic. All right. Yes. Cool. Can you tell us a bit more about your work? So I previously worked with, uh, because, uh, with a urban elephants in Botswana. And uh, I was looking at, uh, since the elephant population all around Africa is decreasing, but the only place where they're stable and growing is in Botswana, they're coming into contact with people in uh, urban settings like cities. So I was uh, looking to understand what happens once they, you reach a number of uh, individuals of a species that you come into contact with people at a frequent time. And given the uh, dangerous nature of elephants it was a very interesting point because uh, when I was researching it it was the during the time where they had uh, removed the ban a uh, hunting ban on elephants which was a very controversial point in time so what what, what I found out was that uh, it was necessary to uh, utilize the the elephants by hunting them and so on for economic benefits for the people to have their population stay at a stable rate. Because if the local people do not have any um, economical benefits from them, they would literally yeah. over hunt them and uh, you know, retaliatory killings and so on, so which, which would cause a, a, big, a bigger issue. I, I'm seeing a few comments here that I'd like to highlight as well. Uh, there is one, uh, Dr. Chong was asking Francois whether, what was the survival rate of pangolins recovered from the illegal trade after they're released? Uh, and Francois says that from his, from his experience, their survival rate is not high because just like what Chuang was saying as well, a lot of the pangolins you receive are already in a compromised state. Uh, they've been through long journeys in transit. They're not uh, being kept in particularly good condition. Uh, so that's why a lot of them don't survive very long uh, after being released. Uh, yeah, which is very, very unfortunate. Uh, Jeffrey Chang as well made a, a, a good comment here. If there is really no medical or scientific evidence of pangolin skills and meat being uh, beneficial 
you know, having any med medicinal benefits at all, then there's really no, no point uh, in farming. Uh, yeah. So uh, anybody else have any questions? Uh, I think uh, uh, one of our producer, Elroy, was saying that when organizing the session, we asked the crocodile farmer to share his experience. Elroy, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, Dr. Chong just asked me about it because um, we had a discussion about it earlier. Um, so historically, crocodiles, farm crocodiles did displace um, um, the illegal wall, the illegal poaching of crocodiles um, in the 70s and 80s when the skin was used for um, luxury leather. So, but it's very important to know that crocodiles and pangolins are very different animals. Um, the reproduction rate, everything is different. So. Um, anybody who, who thinks that is a good comparison probably should go back to the table that Dr. Chong showed earlier and try to see that all the conditions are met before attempting to farm or even breed a pangolin. That leads us to the, uh, a very natural conclusion with this question. If farming is not advisable for pangolins, how do we protect pangolins? Uh, I, I hope uh, that's something Trong you can start to, to talk to us about. And Trong actually has a lot of other videos of pangolins that uh, obviously we love to show because uh, they are just so adorable. And I think that's one of the best ways to show people uh, why this con conservation effort is important. So first of all, uh, can you guys answer the question, all of our experts uh, and those from different parts of the world as well. If farming is not advisable, what's the best way to protect pangolins from from extinction? Well, I can make a comment on that. That leads in actually to what I was just talking to Jeffrey about, um, how <clears throat> habitat preservation, um, we, we, we've talked about deforestation, that's probably that's more relevant really for the, um, for the Asian species and three of the um, African species, but I think the the the, the, the Temmins pangolin in South Africa isn't a forest species. So, I think habitat preservation as a whole, uh, really, I think is is key. But um, I, th I think that the you 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 can't just look at it in isolation. Um, you know, a lot of the hunting for pangolins is um, for commercial purposes, but not all of it. There's also um, a lot of traditional values and customs. Um, not just in Asia, but in Africa too, um, on um, eating um, the pangolins and you know themselves. Um, and I think that the points around um, proving that there's no medicinal benefits for 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 consuming pangolin meat, I'm just not sure that that would be effective as an argument for Asian consumers because it. it my understanding is that that comes down a lot to um, status um rather than sort of like a necessarily a taste preference there's, there's all of these social science aspects to it um yep. so i think you, you you need to look at your traditional conservation methods of you know preservation and and um but also working with local communities and looking at the social science behind um consumption um and i think those two are um, so intricately linked together, um, sort of for, for conservation purposes, the, the you know rescuing of um, the the pangolins from the you know at the, at the front line from the illegal wildlife trade um, is obviously great, but again, um, the you know very sad success rate of releasing these animals. Uh, reflects a lot of other species in terms of they're either not able to be released or they don't survive well after they've been released and in, and in most countries there just aren't the facilities there to um yeah to, you know to, to manage them and and, and in, yeah. in relation to some of the animals they don't know which country they've come from um, and you, you could be introducing diseases from one pangolin in vietnam to to a pangolin population in myanmar for example so um I think that stopping it from happening in the first place is is probably key without wanting to undermine at all any of the efforts going in, in you know in that go on in rehabilitation and release. I think we addressed this early in the previous in the Fulman party with Corona as well, uh, where uh, the representative from traffic uh, was saying that the the buying the demand has to stop first, right? Uh, it has to stop yeah. there. And, we're seeing a, a, I'm seeing a, a chat message from Adam Moreno as well talking about alligator farming and the saying that the risk 
uh, that you come with farming wildlife is that you actually create the demand in the first place. So a yeah. lot of people not have been interested in in this this type of uh, in this type of product. And once it becomes legalized, you're creating demand, and then it feeds, and then you have to continue farming it to meet that demand. So mm -hmm. so there is that danger as well. I I think I saw uh, a raised hand from uh, was it a Sarah? Sorry, a Sarah. Yeah, Sarah Heinrich. Yeah, just wanted to add on to that. Um, so um, I think apart from um, demand uh, or aware, awareness raising campaigns and uh, trying to reduce the demand, um, what's really important is just effective law enforcement as well, because um, a lot of the times um, pangolin trafficking or wildlife trafficking in general is just not really considered um, as important as other crimes. And um, wildlife crime and wildlife trafficking just needs to be on the political agenda and as, as long as it's um, not considered a serious crime in many countries, um, nothing's really going to change. And I mean, corruption plays into that as well. I mean, it, it, it just takes a lot of uh, coordination and organization to ship off tons and tons of African pangolin scales um, over to Asia. Um, and there needs to be like an officer or some, some official involved uh, for this to be able to happen. So this needs to be tackled. Thank you so much for that comment, Sarah, because this gives me a perfect opportunity to once again talk about the role that the journalists have played in this project in, in, in pangolin conservation uh, in the different countries where the ERC has done, done some great work. Because for example, here in Malaysia, what Elra has done with the investigation into the illegal wildlife trade is expose that type of corruption that you were talking about. Uh, so he was able to actually speak to police officers, border patrol officers between Malaysia and Thailand, uh, where the pangolins were just having a, f the, the smugglers were having a free ride to bring the pang pangolins to Thailand and all the way to Vietnam and China. Uh, and because of those exposés that he did and, and work of people like, like Trang, uh, in Malaysia, we were, uh, actually, there was actually an anti-corruption uh, probe uh, investigation that was launched to try to tackle this. Uh, even the, the chief inspector of the police here in Malaysia has promised to, to clamp down on this. So once again, we'd really, really like to thank the ERC for enabling us to do a lot of this work, uh, for making this session possible in the first place. So if you can, please, please, after this, go check out the ERC's website and the great work that they're doing and support them as much as you can. We also have two more sessions coming up, uh, one about uh, indigenous people and wildlife hunting, and another one on traditional Chinese medicine and the, and the, and the demand for wildlife that it creates. All right, so thank you everyone for coming for the Wildlife Study Group. Uh, please uh, join us for the next one. Take care everyone, goodbye. Thank you everybody. One thing that's really um, struck me from today um, is the opportunity for more information sharing between um, people working on the African species and the Asian species. It's great. This has been a very great opportunity for me to learn, to understand better, and then how to educate people out there about the survival of our life. I think that uh, having an interactive platform is the best way to go because uh, this is how I think we can uh, engage more people because I'm not gonna lie, I, I did my fair share of reading reports and so on, and that is not fun. It's, uh, it's not always the... <laughs> not always the best thing you can look forward to. I mean, even if the topic is super interesting, I think that having a conversation with somebody and talking about it is the easiest way to put the message across.